welcome back to the 7000 you joined at the right time um right now i am doing a singleness series i'm really excited about the series there are so many lessons in the bible that can be applied to a single life um closed doors relationships rejection value self-worth so i'm really excited to dive into today's episode uh, which is the three types of people that you might encounter should feel about your value even in the face of these three types of people so without further ado let's dive in this one has been in the works for a long time and i mean i was in for samuel at the beginning of the year and i just i took so many notes while i was in it and it just god spoke to me in so many ways through these passages and I found myself having this conversation with a lot of people finding finding that a lot of people found encouragement through these lessons so I'm just gonna dive in so today we're gonna talk about your value and three t- three types of people you're going to encounter throughout your life and how they will react to your value so first Samuel chapter 8 Samuel is in a unique position where God asks him to anoint the first king of Israel. And he's in a unique position because he is technically doing the choosing, but God is doing the choosing through him, which is a lot how a lot of times in our lives, God works the same way. You know, there's always this argument of who makes the choice, especially when it comes to marriage or relationships. Like, is it my choice or is it God's choice? I think it's a little bit of both. I think when you surrender your choice to God, when you surrender yourself to his will, God leads. But he also works hand in hand with you and with your will because God doesn't force anybody to do anything. That's my personal opinion and theology, but I'm sure a lot of people out there have different theologies. But that's not my theology. I think that God gives us free will. Anyway, going back to Samuel, I think you could especially relate to Samuel if you were a girl, especially when it comes to dating and relationships, because Samuel was supposed to choose a king, which means he was choosing somebody to submit to and somebody for the children of Israel to submit to. So keep that in mind. And that's important. You need to choose somebody that is worth submitting to. When when Samuel first saw Saul, first samuel chapter 9 it talks about saul and it says um he meaning saul's dad saul's father had a choice and handsome son whose name was saul there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of israel from his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people so this is what saul looks like and then later it says that when samuel saw saul chapter 17 there he is the man of whom i spoke to you This one shall reign over my people. So when Samuel looked up and saw a tall, handsome person, God's like, that's the king. Keep that in mind. I'm going fast because there's so much to talk about and I don't want to make this very long uh, episode. Turn to chapter 16. Samuel, uh, Saul blows it. He keeps, at first he's doing really good, but he starts spiraling down. He starts getting confident and not the good kind of confident and he just he's he he's making mistakes after mistakes but the one that the the final straw was when he overlooked samuel he was supposed to go into battle but before going into battle he had to talk to the prophet that was god's role samuel had a very specific role but saul got antsy and didn't want to wait for samuel So he overstepped him and did it himself, um, made a sacrifice on his own and then went into battle. And God was like, you were not supposed to do that. I'm done with you. Samuel, you have to remember, was there from the very beginning, from the very inception of Saul's reign. So he got very attached and he was mourning. He knew that Saul had messed up and he was done, but he was very sad and he mourned. And then God said, Chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? 
Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. There's so many things in that chapter. First of all, how long are you going to mourn for Saul, seeing I have chosen somebody else? Sometimes people in our lives mess up. And especially when it comes to relationships or when it comes to dating or when it comes to maybe somebody you you haven't dated yet but maybe your your friends and you know that it's kind of headed in that direction and then the person drops the ball and disappoints you significantly and then you're mourning for what could have been right you're mourning for this person could have been this amazing king over israel or this this person could have been an amazing spouse this person could have been we, there could have been right you're mourning for what could have been but it's not up to you it's up to that person right um and it's easy to get stuck there and i think god for some of us this is the message today which is how long were you mourn for saul there's a time for to mourn the bible says there's a time for everything but there is a time to stop there's a time to stop mourning and to get ready for the next thing and the next person the second thing is how long will we mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him for reigning over Israel. I think it's so interesting that God says, I have rejected him. Because technically the person that did the rejecting was Saul towards Samuel. Because Saul didn't see Samuel's value and overstepped him. And sometimes people will not see your value. And the rejection will feel personal. But God is saying, yeah, it's personal in earthly terms. But in heavenly terms, I don't want you with them. Like in, in heavenly terms, I've rejected them from your future. Like this this isn't my plan. This isn't my plan for you anymore. Or maybe never was. How long will you mourn? Seeing I've rejected this. The third thing is, fill your horn with oil and go. Disappointment will run you dry. And in the Bible, oil a lot of time represents the Holy Spirit, and a time of refreshing. God has something new for you. But before you could step into your next thing, I think you need the Holy Spirit. I think you need to spend some time in the prayer closet and you need to recharge. You're running on empty. You can't go from disappointment to trying again. Yes, get up and try again. But first, spend some time with God. First, Fill your battery. First, um, be filled. Be refilled. All right. So, God sends Samuel to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And he's like, one of his sons is the next king. And then, chapter, uh, verse 6. So, it was when they came, the sons, that he looked at Eliab. Eliab was the oldest, I believe. And Samuel said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Like, sh surely this must be the one. Why? Because he was tall and good looking, just like Saul was. And remember when Samuel first saw Saul, it was at first sight, he's like, God's like, that's the one, right? And now Samuel's reliving the past and he expects God to work in the same pattern that he did back then. People follow patterns, but God doesn't necessarily work in the same way twice. And maybe in your life, you need you need that little reminder. Don't expect something just because God did it that exact way again. God is original. God could do things completely different this time, and that doesn't mean they're less beautiful. And God says... Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. There is so much here. So, first of all, don't look at his appearance. You missed the first time when you saw Saul, and you're like, that's the one. You missed it. You didn't get it. You thought that I chose him because he was impressive. You think that I'm choosing someone based off of how they impress people, at what people look at? That's not what I look like, look at. And this is an encouragement for you if you feel maybe undervalued by people. God doesn't see how people see. God sees the heart. And God rewards according to the heart, not according to 
people's judgment system. But the next thing is, I always thought, okay, cool, God looks at the heart, so that means God saw something really special in David. Yes, he did, but it's not just what God saw in David, it's what God didn't see in Eliab. And I never ever realized until this year, and then I got to chapter 17, and all you have to do is flip the page. And 1 Samuel 17, verse 28, let me give a little context. So Goliath comes, we all know the story of Goliath and David. Goliath is mocking the children of Israel, and all the warriors, all the big tough guys are hiding. They're being, they're chickening out. And then little David comes, and he calls everybody out, including his brothers. And guess who gets defensive? Eliab, the one that Samuel thought this must be the one because he's tall, and his outward appearance looks kingly. But he chickened out just like everybody else, and not only that, he passed his opportunity to repent of his fear. Uh, not of his fear, excuse me, of his cowardice. Because fear, courage is not the absence of fear, it's how you act in the face of it. So, verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of heart. For you've come down to see the battle. He gets defensive and he calls David the thing that he is. He's being hypocritical. He calls David prideful. But in reality, his pride puffed up. Because I really believe he could have turned around here. David was calling them out. And he could have been like, you know what, David? You're right. We shouldn't hide from this mocker. This guy that's mocking God. He, How, how could we allow this? You're, you're right. I'm going to join you on this. Do you realize he could have had the title of a giant slayer? He could have probably shared in that victory. He could have probably been a bigger part of the story. But I certainly don't remember him. His name doesn't ring a bell when I hear it. I don't know if he's ever mentioned again. I, Off the top of my head, I don't ever remember him being mentioned again in the Bible. Maybe he is. But it's definitely not a major role. Um, but what I think is interesting is that this is where we see the test of the heart. Remember how God says, I don't look at the way you look at things. I, I test the heart. I look at the heart. And Samuel had to trust that. And move on to the next and the next and the next until he got to David. Even though he didn't see the reality of it. All he saw was what he saw on the outside. Probably had a great personality too. He saw this tall, good looking guy that looked like he could really fit the role of the king, but he had to move on from that when God said no, even though he didn't see why. And we don't see why until we flip the page and then we see the test come in his life and he fails it. And a lot of times in your life, sometimes God will give you a no. And now I'm specifically talking about relationships, but this could this could apply to anything in your life. But sometimes God will really show you the contents of somebody's heart or won't really show you the reason. But you still have to trust that there is a reason, if you don't, even if you don't see it. And then, of course, we all know that David wins the victory. Um, and David, where others failed, he had courage. Where others dropped the ball, he picked up his little sling and he won the victory. He put his faith in God, even in the face of fear. I'm sure he felt just as afraid as everybody else. By the way, one of the rewards for overcoming this was um, exemption from taxes, wealth, and Saul's daughter. You literally got the girl by facing the giant. I think that is so symbolic because, you know, we all grew up listening to the stories of the princess in the castle guarded by a dragon. And some, I think that every... Every love story, I think, has a dragon or a Goliath. And I, this is like just now me rambling about my personal opinions, but I think they're worth sharing. I think that somebody's desire to be with you, that, emo that, that should be bigger than their fear of the giant. There will always be giants. Whether that giant is fear of finances, whether that, whatever the giant is, 
there will always be giants, but I think it's kind of like a natural inborn test of whether somebody's really worthy of the prize. So don't be discouraged when people don't get the prize, which if you're a girl, that is you. You're the prize. Um, don't be upset when people don't get the prize because people have to prove themselves. This is going to sound, this could sound bad if people take in the wrong contest, but people have to prove that they're willing to slay the giants for you. Um, so when it comes to your value, there are three types of people. And remember, the Lord is the one that tests the heart. The first type of person is like Saul. Where they will just not see your value. They will not see your value. They will overstep you. They will forget you when times get tough. Or when you take your time. They will just not see your value. That, the same way Saul didn't see Samuel's value. I'm not saying he didn't see his value, but in that moment, he overstepped his value. And he, he had a lot of pride and self-reliance. The second kind of person is like Eliab. It's not necessarily that he didn't value the things that Saul was offering for whoever would overcome Goliath. But he allowed fear to win rather than put his trust in God. And if you ever, and I've talked to people before where they're like, everything was going so good until this thing came and they became afraid and they, you know, they sympathize so much like, oh, this guy is so afraid. And I, if you could just overcome it's great to be a cheerleader and to want people to win their fears over. But don't let the disappointment get to you so badly if they don't. Because maybe that person needs to be taken through more lessons in courage. And God will have his own blessing and story for them. I'm sure Eliab had his own life and God had his own story with him. But it just wasn't this story. It wasn't the kingly story that David earned. Um, and also there was some pride that puffed up there too uh, when he was called out. David called him out and he, instead of being like, you're right, he dug his heels in the ground. So that's another thing to watch out for. And, and nobody's perfect. We've all made these mistakes. But, you know, as you're listening to this, maybe you're one of the people that has made these mistakes. Learn from them. And I'm certainly learning from them myself. And then there's a third type of person, which is the David type of person that puts their trust in God and they're humble. Um, and God sees their heart before Goliath ever comes. But once Goliath comes, you will see the test. You will see how they handle that. So just like um, the majority of the passage-based podcast that I have, I want to go into a couple of reflection questions. So the first one is, when Samuel saw Saul, God told him that he's the one. And Saul, Samuel recognized God's voice. The question is, do you recognize God's voice like this? And especially in relationships, you really, really have to be careful because God is speaking. God is showing you red flags, green flags, yellow flags. God is showing you these things, but you have to be tuned in. A lot of times when things are happening in our lives, we could get really excited to the point where we kind of tune God's voice out. We kind of rush to our devotional time because we are more likely to spend quality time with God in our moments of suffering and sadness and disappointment and loneliness. But when we don't feel that, we're so excited to talk to somebody new or to um, go do the exciting thing happening in our life that we kind of neglect that. So don't neglect God's voice. The second question is, Saul's last straw was overlooking Samuel. And what area of your life do you feel overlooked? Do you tend to take it personally when that happens? And if you do, don't. <laughs> don't. Samuel is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. If he based his worth based on how Saul treated him, he would be very insecure. Your security doesn't come from the way people treat you. Your security comes from God. If a person has a diamond in their hand and places the diamond on a table in the middle of a crowded room and walks away, that's not a reflection of the value of the diamond. 
usually that's a reflection of the person that was taking care of it. They didn't really understand the value. But the diamond still has its value. And same with you. The next question. God told Samuel to stop mourning for Saul. Who or what do you need to stop mourning? Maybe it's a person. Maybe, um, and maybe you're just waiting for something endlessly. Is, is God asking you to stop? One of the beautiful things about the community I grew up in, the Romanian community, is we were really taught to pray. And we were really taught to persist in prayer. And there's a lot of power in that. But one of the things we were never, I never really learned was when to stop um, persisting for something. And a lot of times there's this misconception that if you pray long enough or hard enough for something, it will happen. In a lot of cases, yes, keep persisting. But there are certain instances, and I pray for God's discernment right now, even as I'm sharing this, that this would reach the right person. There are times when hope is actually poisonous because it's false and it's not true and it's not from God. So ask yourself, who or what do you need to stop mourning? The next question, number four. Samuel was told to fill his horn with oil before moving on to the next Is your horn filled with oil or are you running on empty from discouragement and stuck on the last thing? If you have recently hit a wall or if you, God is calling you to the next season or to move on because there's something better for you, have you spent some time with God just in refreshment? Um... A lot of times in the healing process, sometimes you have to go through healing, right? After certain experiences, especially when it comes to this context of singleness. But I think a lot of times we tend to run to um, psychology or, you know, videos. And those could all be great, but... Nothing will ever heal you like locking the door and spending time in your prayer closet and talking to God. Fill your horn with oil. Don't neglect that. Before moving on to the next thing. Fifth question. Samuel thought Eliab was the next one because he looked like Saul. How are you expecting God to act in old patterns? And how can you prepare your heart to let him work in new ways? There was a long time in my life, maybe my early 20s, where I was really glorifying certain years of my life. And yes, those were the best experiences ever because that's when I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's when I got baptized in water. That's when I really found my purpose in the kingdom of God, and my passion was awakened, right? Those are defining moments I will always go back to in times of hardship. But the good old days are not always the best days or the only good old days you will ever have. And sometimes we think, oh, that's how it happened last time. It has to happen exactly like this. God doesn't have to follow our schedule and our expectations just because something happened a certain way once. Next question. God told Samuel Eliab wasn't right even before the test came to prove that. Do you trust God to let relationships and opportunities go even if you don't see the why? Is there anything in your life that God is asking you to move on from? And you're not seeing why, but you still have to obey that. There's this story that popped up recently. And by recently, I mean like the last two years. But 
it popped up in sermons like three times, like three different sermons from three different people. And I'll share it with you. It's the way people, you, you've probably heard this, but in case you haven't, the way they trap monkeys is they put out in the jungle, like they put this box with a hole just big enough for a monkey to put its open hand inside. And then inside the box, they'll put a banana or something like shiny. I've heard I've heard both things, um, either something shiny or a banana. We'll go with the banana. So the monkey puts its hand and then grabs the banana. But the hole is only small enough for the monkey's open hand. But once it grabs a banana, it makes a fist, right? When you grab something, you make a fist. And when it tries to take it out, it can't because it no longer fits through the opening. And then the hunter comes and can easily grab the monkey because even though it sees the hunter coming towards it, it sees the danger and then the, the trapper could kill it, could harm it, and it will not let go for the life of it. And that's how you trap a monkey. So my question to you is, what are you holding on to with a fist? When God gives us something, it might be from God, but he doesn't want you to ever hold something with a fist. When God gives you something, hold it with an open hand. He gives and takes away. Don't ever hold on to something that tightly. So, is God asking you to let go of something even if you don't see the why? Next. Eliab forfeited his chance for repentance because he couldn't take David's helpful criticism of his actions. Is there any area of your life that you are being stubborn in that might be forfeiting your victory? He could have been a giant slayer along with David, but he lost that chance because he couldn't change. Is there any area of your life where you're missing out? On blessings because you're being stubborn next question first Samuel chapter 17 verse 45 which says then David said to the Philistine you come to me with a sword with a spear and with a javelin but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied others use spears and javelins but David trusted God what practical spears and javelins, quote unquote, do you need to stop placing your trust in? If you think about it, if David compared himself to everybody else, everybody else there was a warrior. Everybody else there was a soldier. He was just a shepherd. And all the experts told him, this is the way to do it. He was the least qualified person there, and he wasn't even using the right tools. But if he would have placed his trust in that, he might have never won the victory. Don't look to your left hand or to your right. Don't look at the reality as the world puts it. Don't trust the experts. There are times not to trust the There are times to take advice, but there are times not to trust the experts. There are times when even though you don't seem qualified, and even though you don't seem to have the right tools, God still wants to give you a victory. So what are those tools that you need to stop putting your trust in? Maybe you have a certain lack, let's say in finances, and God is calling you to ministry, and you're like, well, I would love to do this, but I don't have the right finances. Is there anything you need to step forward in faith in, even without a spear and javelin? And then the last question. David was willing to face his giant. What giants do you need to face in your life? in order to get your blessing. You know, this this episode will mostly relate to the girls. But maybe you are a guy, and maybe there are giants in your life. Um, like fear. Fear of the future. Oh, I would love to get married one day, but what if? What if my job can't provide? What if this? What if that? What giants do you need to overcome to get to the blessing? Or... Vice versa, what giant did others not face for you that leaves you discouraged? Have faith that the giant can be a test in disguise and that the right man will face it for you. So don't look at Saul when he devalues you. 
Don't look at Eliab when he doesn't want to face his giants and when he gets defensive. God has a David for you that's going to put his trust in God and face the giants and win the victory. Um, so that's all I have for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it because it really helped me a lot. And I kept going back to this over and over through different seasons and lessons. Um, and I feel like every time I go back to it, something else and something fresh sticks out to me. But the bottom line that I want to leave you with is this. No matter which type of person you're facing, don't mourn for what was. Don't mourn for Saul. And don't look at the outward appearance. Don't look at Eliab. Don't look at what humans look at. Know that God is the one that tests the heart. And he wants a heart of David for you. And he wants you to have a heart of David. One that puts its trust in him. And when we do that, God has good things for us. And he's going to bless us. And he's going to reward us. And he's going to help us fight our giants. Whatever they may be. Um, so that's it. I hope it was encouraging to you. I will. I want to have a lot more series just like this one about um, these types of topics. Um, if this was encouraging to you, please share it with a friend. Share it with somebody that's been facing some closed doors lately. Somebody that's been feeling devalued, maybe. Or somebody that just needs to face their giants. And I hope to see you next time.